We are recording with John Krauthammel. It is Friday, June 11th, 2021. Well, I graduated from college in uh, May 67. And at that time, the Vietnam War was raging, so everyone in college had a student deferment, but as soon as you graduated or left college within a month, my draft status changed to 1A. Um, so I decided I'm, you know, I'm going to be going into the service no matter what. So I, I started buying these books at the bookstore. I didn't want to go in as a private. Uh, since I had a degree, I could go, I could go in an officer, as an officer. So I started buying books well, from the Air Force, taking the Air Force officer's test, the Navy test, uh, the Army test, uh, to bone up on that. And... Um, I took, I passed the Air Force test and the Army test, uh, and I went for a physical for the Air Force because it was under the pilot program. But when I, the results of the physical was I could not be a pilot because I had a slight stigmatism in one eye, but I could be, I could be a navigator. So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and then I got my draft notice, so um, to report for a physical for the Army. So. I was talking to a recruiter and with the Army, and they said, well, you have two choices right now, infantry or artillery. <laughs> well, it wasn't that much, wasn't much of a decision for me, uh, so I agreed to go to Officers Kennedy School for artillery. And I got sworn in in Newark in January 68. Um, there were Two or three of us from, and there was there must have been 50 people there getting sworn in. Two or three of us were giving, given, everyone went to Fort Dix and two or three of us were singled out and were given plane tickets to fly to St. Louis to go to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri uh, for basic training rather than Fort Dix. So that was probably one of the worst two months of my life was going through basic because it was winter and um, Fort Leonard Wood is called Little Korea because it, it was just cold every day. Everybody was sick. You know, I was sick for seven of the eight weeks um, running a fever. But we got through it and then they put us on buses and, and bust us out to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where they did advanced training and artillery and, and 23 weeks of uh, officer candidate school. Um, and in November, uh, 68 I was commissioned and uh, during that towards the end of the training I got orders to go to Vietnam uh, which half the class got orders for that uh, and um, then I went on leave through Christmas uh, and then um, right after Christmas I was ordered to go to Panama for jungle school so I spent a spent a week down there um, and then at the end of January um, then I came home on took a couple of weeks leave at the end of January uh, we went over to Vietnam which was a very long flight um, <laughs> so we got there um, and everyone in my class that initially got orders to Vietnam everyone went um, to an infantry unit or an artillery unit, I got assigned to an armored cavalry regiment, which was tanks and modified armed personnel carriers. They put two more machine guns on them, and and that and my job there was as a forward observer, which you would go out with the front line units, and that whenever we made contact with the enemy, my job was to call in artillery fire or helicopter gunships or Air Force jets, whatever was available at the time, and, and call that on top of the enemy, which, which I did. Um, I did that for six months, um, and the regiment had, had three squadrons, and each squadron had a, um, an artillery battery. It was a 155-millimeter self-propelled artillery uh, howitzers. So after about six months as a forward observer, you would then rotate back 
to the battery and become a fire direction officer where you would take the calls in and, and do the math and what's needed to direct artillery fire to, who, to whoever needed it. Uh, and I did that for the, for the rest of my tour. But with the Army Cavalry Regiment, the, the artillery battery was never too far from the front line units because we were the direct support. Normally we were out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, um, there were no, no, no surveys done. We were just out there on our own. Um, so we, were, we maintained close contact with the front line units to provide artillery support. So needless to say that if you're that close to the front line units, you're going to have some of the problems front line units have. So we were many times we you know we would have mortars dropped on us or um, 120 millimeter rockets were fired at us. So and that's the way it was until um, we left. But we since we were an armored cavalry regiment, we're always moving. We're always on the move. Um, normally we were up around the Cambodian border. Um, so we saw a lot of action up there. We're, the South Vietnam was divided up into four corps. We were in three corps, which was Saigon from the sea out to the Cambodian border. And we spent most of our time up by the Cambodian border. Uh, so, you know, we, um, being an armored unit, you made, you made contact with a lot of, uh, <laughs> with the enemy, shall we say. Uh, we were always out in the middle of nowhere, so we we're fending for ourselves out there most of the time. The thing about the, this tank is this this big, it's not a searchlight, they call it a pink light. It was somewhat infrared, so you so at night you could see, you know, when you're on the perimeter, you could you would you would turn on your your pink light and you could you could see in the dark. So but this is this is a typical camp. Whenever you pulled into camp and, and set up for the night, because you you know you were just pulling in, make a circle and and, and set up your defenses. But mm -hmm. this is this is basically the setup of every track. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a lot of mud, a lot of dirt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you just you you were never you were never in a base camp that long where they had hot showers. You it, you each track had their own had a canvas bag. With a with a shower nozzle on the bottom of it, and you would you would put it on top of the track, and then you would what we would do is, and then you had these these five gallon cans of uh, of water, and what you do is you take the C4 explosives and put it around the can and burn it, and that that's how you got your warm water for your shower, and then you would throw it in the canvas bag and the, the, turn on the shower head, and that's that's how you took your showers off the side of the track. Usually we had. A, um, we had cartons and cartons of sea rations, which were cans. Uh, you know, uh, well, like Thanksgiving 1969, I celebrated Thanksgiving by opening a can of turkey loaf. <laughs> so, you know, basically we lived on sea rations, and if we were in one spot for for a few days, then, then the regiment would send helicopters with uh, uh, metal containers of warm food. And then we set up a kitchen, and, and and we would eat that way. But a lot of a lot of times, you were just eating sea rations, you know. And you would again, if you wanted warm food, you would you would take a little bit of C4 and put it around the, your little sea ration can and light it, and uh, um, and then it would heat up your food. You had a warm dinner that way. <laughs> uh, it's 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. Um, uh, this one book here that you can take with you. This is a history of the regiment. It goes back to uh, uh, early 20th century when the army went into Mexico looking for Pancho Villa. That was the beginning of the 11th Cavalry Regiment. It was actually a cavalry regiment with horses. And, and they became mechanized in World War One. When you know they became mechanized, and they were they they were part of a, a larger um, uh, contingent during World War Two, uh, armored. They were in Germany. Um, I don't know if they were affiliated with Patton or not, but uh, but that's all in this in the book here. It gives a whole history.
of the regiment and they still they still they still exist today they are now out in the deserts in California they do a lot of the desert training for the units going to Afghanistan and, and Iraq they do a lot of the training with the armored divisions for desert warfare any interaction with close interaction with uh, Air Force units during your time we other, other than um, Sometimes if they were available, I would call in Air Force jets. Um, I would communicate with the, uh, what do they call them, FACs or TACs or, you know, um, you know, uh, and they would, they would coordinate. Uh, I know we did, um, several uh, Air Force jets came in if we, you know, if there was, if we had meeting a lot of, meeting a lot of resistance from the enemy, we would, I would call in Air, the Air Force would send in jets, and I would I would um, direct them on the target, and they would drop some bombs on the target, and that would be the end of it. Sometimes we were close to when the uh, Air Force B-52s came around and saturated the area with 2,000-pound bombs. That was uh, um, that was a rumble like an earthquake, you know. Um, but uh, that's the interface I had with the Air Force. Well, around Christmas in January, we were given a decision we could extend for six months in a combat zone and get out of the Army right away, or we could go back stateside and I could spend 10 months stateside and get out of the Army at that time. So it didn't take much of a genius to figure out I'm going to do 10 months stateside rather than six more months. And it was a good decision because then April, the regiment spearheaded the invasion of Cambodia. So uh, I'm glad I was I was smiling broadly back stateside when, when I was reading in the papers that our regiment spearheaded the invasion. Um, but one, you know, one of the few perks being over there is I did, I did, I had two, two R and R tours. Um, I did a week in Sydney, Australia, which is absolutely great. Uh, I'd like to go back there again. And I did, uh, a week in Bangkok, Thailand, which was, uh, which is also very nice. Some folks decide to uh, re-up and stay as a career in the service. So talk to me a little bit about thoughts at the time of that option and your, you know, did that weigh at all on something to consider or if not, uh, you know, explain to me why. I, I didn't be, well, I, when I got back to Fort Sill, they assigned me, and I was an artillery officer. They assigned me to a Pershing missile unit. I had no idea. I had no experience in that whatsoever. And basically, uh, they asked me to, to head up a contingent to go out to take a, a convoy out to uh, Blanding, Utah, on top of a mesa, which is in the middle of nowhere, living in Quonset huts, no, no, uh, no indoor plumbing, no warm showers, um, for another six months, and that was the launch site for the Pershing missile. We would launch the missiles into White Sands, um, and the only thing I was assigned was I was the I was in charge of the motor pool, and then every two weeks I would take a small convoy down to Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and pick up uh, either. Um, West German troops or Seventh Army troops stationed in Germany, who were flying in so that they could do live launches of Pershing missiles from our launch site, and that was basically it. Basically, I was camping for another. I've been camping for a year in Vietnam, and then they, then I came home and and they sent me out camping again for for another six months, and then. At, Towards October, just before I got out, they wanted to know if I if I wanted to re up. I'm gone. I've been camping for a year and a half. The last thing I want to do is do more of this because they told me that, you know, I would be at Fort Sill over the winter, but in spring we would go to another launch site uh, out in Utah. It would be the same thing. So I said, no, I I think I'll just get out. <laughs> so I had to do a couple of years reserve time, in active reserve. Um, and that, I didn't have to do anything with that. They said if I went active reserves, I could get 
two ranks above what I was. At that time, I was a first lieutenant, so I would have been a major in the active reserves. And I talked to <clears throat> excuse me, a colonel in the reserves about it, and he goes, that's yeah, not really that. First 20 years are pretty tough, but after that, it's not bad. I'm going, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> For those of us who had a similar experience in a time frame, talk to me a little bit about graduating college and, uh, you know, what, what had you wanted to do career-wise? And was there anything about the Army experience that you could hang your hat on and, and, and say, well, this is, this is going to benefit me down the road if you know, want to get into a career that I had really planned for? I mean, that's kind of a convoluted question. But yeah. Talk to me about the transition thought about, uh, you know, if I, if I survive this whole experience, how, how can I get, get back into a, a, a line of work and what did I take actually from the military experience that maybe benefited me? That's, that's the question. Um, my undergraduate degree is in biology and I really wanted to go into oceanography. Um, the problem was that at that time anybody who graduated from college, any male who graduated from college, was eligible for the draft, so nobody wanted to hire you. I had stayed out, uh, I graduated from a school in Ohio, so I had stayed out there with a friend of mine um, and tried to get jobs out there and no one would hire me because you're going to be drafted within two months, so we're not going to hire you. I was accepted uh, for a position at Columbia University School of Oceanography to go on a and I wanted, they were going to do a uh, tour in the Indian Ocean on a research vessel. And they said, they're not going to hire me for that because I, even though I was perfect, I was the perfect candidate for them, they weren't going to hire me because I'd be out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, I would get drafted and they would have to fly me back. So they said, we're not going to hire you. So, you know, I couldn't find a job. I, I had done, I was doing menial labor jobs. Uh, to earn money after college, and then I got my draft notice, and that all changed. As far as uh, uh, what translates from the military to what I could use in civilian life, the Army told me it was four hours of map reading. That was it. <laughs> so I got out. I got out in, in November 70. I got out, um, and at that time the job market wasn't that great either, so I, I did substitute teaching. Um, because I grew up in Paramus, New Jersey. Um, so I was a substitute teacher at the, in the Paramus school system for a while, and I drove a school bus just so I could earn some money. Uh, at that point, uh, my father had passed away while I was at Fort Sill, and so I was living with my mother at the time in an apartment in Rochelle Park. So, you know, um, so I was earning money any way I could because you know, I was helping her with her expenses. And um, a friend of mine from high school said, you know, the FBI is hiring natural science degree people. You might want to look into that. So I, you know, I made some inquiries there. At that time, there was an office in Hackensack. So I went and talked to somebody. And in February, well, before that, I had also gotten a job finally in, in the biological area working in um, Little Falls, New Jersey, at a pharmaceutical company in their in their lab testing, um, you know, doing doing lab work for on their product for sterility and stuff like that. Um, so uh, February second, nineteen seventy two, um, I was hired by the FBI, and I retired thirty years later. The FBI, when they hire, they're, they're looking, they're not taking anybody straight out of college, at least as agents. They want somebody with at least three years managerial experience so that they want, they want a leader. They want to hire a leader um, right off. So there are many of us, many of us uh, coming out of the military, whatever service, the officers, and, and many of the uh, more senior enlisted people, you know, are managers. So they, they hired a lot of us um, from our experience. Um, um, so 
the the leadership and and being an officer, you know, it, it, it definitely that that's what got me hired to be an agent with the FBI. I first, when I first joined the FBI for the first three years, I was not an agent. I served in a support capacity. I was in Newark, New Jersey, and I met. In fact, um, that's where I met my wife. Um, she was my first supervisor and still is. <laughs> and uh, so I was. I was there for three years, and then I got orders to go to Quantico to be an agent. I went through agents training, and my wife and I got married before I became an agent. Um, and my mother remarried, so we took over, took over her apartment in Rochelle Park during that time. And then I, I went to agents training, and during agents training, you get what they call a dream sheet, where you'd like to be assigned when you get out of training. Usually, and that's why they call it a dream sheet, because I wanted to go to Cincinnati, and they sent me to New York City. So. <laughs> We were living in Rochelle Park, and they and uh, we were. I was, you know, I was married, and um, so they they owed me a move. So I said, well, let's let's buy a house. Um, so we were looking around up in Bergen County area, and and someone suggested, oh, one of my wife's co-workers said, you know, you might want to check the. Chatham, Madison, Morristown area. There's some nice houses out there. So we came down here and uh, bought the second. We came, wound up in Chatham. We got a realtor down here um, who actually was a neighbor on the block when we, where we finally moved. And uh, we looked at the second house in Chatham and put money down on it. And that's how we came to Chatham. We've been here ever since. Because my, my, my bureau career was... Uh, <laughs> I went from uh, New York, or from Newark to New York, back to Newark, and then finished up in New York. So I was well traveled. So um, I, I did get to go. I did travel around the country for the bureau, but um, basically my all my office's assignment were in this area, and we stayed in Chatham since we moved in Chatham in 1976, and we're still here. Well, I, I, w I was in basic training in the Army, and the Air Force got back to me and goes, hey, good news, you've been accepted as the navigator program in the Air Force. So I'm going, well, it doesn't do me any good. I'm already in the Army because you didn't get back to me. <laughs> so, you know, that's how that went. But, you know, it's the, the Air Force was a five-year commitment at that time. Um, so my commitment with the Army was after training two years. So I did two years, actually, officially two years, 11 months in the Army. So although the, my experience in the Army would have been different if it was I was in the Air Force. <laughs> now you mentioned that you had colleagues in, in the FBI who uh, were also former military mm -hmm. people. Tell me about uh, any conversations you had with those folks or would you share, share stories and experiences and um, uh, anything that you discovered or learned about those fellow veterans in your work? Well, basically, we all went through the same experiences. Some some people stayed in the military longer than I did, um, but it was basically the same. You got out of college, you were classified one A, so you, you, you didn't want to go in as a private. So some uh, some of them were OTC, some of them went to went to OCS. Uh, no matter what branch of the service it was, whether Marines or what, but it was basically the same experience. Uh, you did your military time and got out, and the FBI was, at that time, the FBI was, was hiring a lot of people. Um, and, and so they decided to do that. So, in fact, we, we would have, every year we would have, um, take all the veterans, the military veterans, and have... Uh, well, we called it Army Day, but it was for anybody with military experience. We would go up to our firearms range. At that time, it was in Peekskill, New York. Um, and we would bring in all these military weapons and just have a, have a good time. <laughs> and we invited the family, so your kids, got, your kids could, could go with you. And, and, and with the firearms instructors, they would, they would teach them how to use these weapons and stuff. So, you know, 
for a kid growing up, that was a pretty good experience. <laughs> you know, I have three daughters, and they, they had a blast. <laughs> Did any of them entertain any idea of military service? No. They, no. <laughs> they, were after, they were after my middle daughter, Amy, um, went to the University of Scranton Nursing School. The, the, the military was after her. The Navy was after her big time. They were willing to pay for her entire college career, all this other stuff, uh, so that she could be a nurse in the Navy, and she didn't want any. She didn't want any part of it. I would sing her. I would sing her airborne songs, and she just wouldn't have any part of it. <laughs> With your um, uh, acceptance, uh, if you wanted it into the navigator thing, did, did you um, did you ever entertain? Pursuing any uh, flying, uh, private pilot license no. at all? No, I no. I was too big. Although I, you know, I, I wanted, you know, I, that's why I initially approached the Air Force. I wanted, I wanted to be a pilot. But um, once I got out of the military and got in the FBI, which was, you know, you were busy all the time and, and raising a family, um, left little time for other things. They do a lot, you know, you read a lot of, uh, uh, they're doing a lot of archiving of uh, World War II veterans and what they went through, you know, an oral history. And I, I, think, I think it's good for, do, to, to have an oral history um, so that it, it doesn't repeat itself. <laughs> you know, let people know what it was like um, and, and so that the stories remain alive. I had a good friend here, um, Tom Malloy. In fact, my wife is still best friends with his wife. He passed away way too young. Um, but he was a, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force Reserve, active Air Force Reserve. Plus, he was a commercial airlines pilot. And we, were, we, we would talk all the time. Um, in fact, we helped start a VFW chapter here in Chatham back in the early 90s. It did it for a few years till the end of the 90s um, and you know um, there are actually few people that I've met that did have military service um, not many people going to the military service now most of the people my age I think a good percentage of them had military service because that was that was during the era of the Vietnam War um, but I don't I don't have a lot of interface with the younger generation of um, veterans who have been through Afghanistan and Iraq, that type of thing. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's good to talk about the old days, I like talking about the old days, but um, it's, it's good to have a, to let the younger generation know what their predecessors went through. Because to, I once called, was talking to a young person, I said, and I told him I was a military, I said, I was in my generation to war. When you think about it, every generation has a war. You had World War II, you had Vietnam, Korea, Vietnam. Now you're in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, you know, at some point, you know, it never stops. I'm one of five children. I, there's four boys in our family. Two of us in high school were smart. Two of us barely got out of high school. <laughs> and many people are that way. There's a lot of kids coming out of high school who, who do not, for whatever reason, um, aren't mature enough, that could, then they don't want to go to college. They want to do something else, which is fine. But, you know, I think the military grows you up, but I can I can speak that from my two brothers. I have a twin brother and and, a, and an older brother, who barely got out of high school, um, and so they went into the Navy, um, and did their three year tour. But when they come, the military teaches you discipline, and it te and it, it you basically you grow up, you mature, and when you come out of the military. You're, if you didn't go to college and you want to go to college now, you're going to do very well because you have that discipline. You know, you know, you have a goal in mind, and you and you can do it. Uh, I would recommend the military 
right now would be a little tough with our current global situation. But, you know, um, the military, I, if, if you don't want to go to college and don't know what you're going to do with your life, the military is, I think, is a one good option because it will mature you, it will teach you something about life, and you'll be ready once you leave the military to, to go into a career.